Adamantius Cordus from Leipzig, historian of Southeastern Europe, research coordinator at this famous GWZO at Leipzig, so this is the Institute for History and Culture of Eastern, Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, he, in his research, he deals with international law, with populism, uh, in comparative perspective in Europe, in Bulgaria, and Macedonian um, uh, history, and his subject for today is the phenomenon of anti federalism after 1848. Uh, Micro Thank you, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And uh, before I start, I would like only to ein bisschen Werbung zu machen, natürlich auch zwei mit Opa mitgebracht von dem zum Institut. Die können auch gleich dann mitgenommen werden. Ich habe da auch ein paar ausgelegt, also von GWZ Dorf, das gerade angesprochen wurde. Ich würde die ungern jetzt wieder mitnehmen wollen. Vielleicht, ich fange gleich an, ich mache gleich die drei wichtigsten Punkte meiner Präsentation auf Deutsch zusammen. Now I will uh, switch into English. Um, as I mentioned also already in German, the topic of my paper uh, refers to the integrated impact of perceived pan-Slavic threats <coughs> and anti-Slav discourses for non-Slavic speaking national communities in the 19th and 20th century Europe, especially after 1848. The main aim of my talk uh, is to show that the perception of the existence of a pan-Slavic community and the pan-Slavic unity was, I would say, constantly much more widespread, spread and much more an issue in the non-Slavic world than among Slavs themselves. To do so, I will elaborate on the German, Italian, Austrian, Hungarian, Greek and Romanian discourse regarding Panslavism and the so-called Panslavic threat from the middle of the 19th to the middle of the 20th century, and we will see how the perception from Russian Panslavism as a threat developed to a perception uh, of Slavo-Communism, for example, in Italy, as a threat perception. During the first half of the 19th century, Panslavism was increasingly identified with Russian expansionism. This was the case, notwithstanding the fact that the idea of Slavic unity was at this time mainly promoted by the Western Slavs of the Habsburg Empire, as we probably discussed in this conference until now. This was the case, uh, notwithstanding the fact that Tsar Nikolaus himself distanced clearly from Pan-Slavic agitation. He did, he did this by taking into consideration an increasing Russophobia in Western Europe, fed, of course, by the writings, writings of Pan-Slavic Russian agitators such as Mikhail Pagodin, Nikolai Danilevsky, or later on Fyodor 
Dostoyevsky. Innumerous pamphlets, travelogues, and political treaties of that time, Russia was described as an aggressive, despotic, and barbaric power of Asian origin that posed a, de a deadly threat to civilized Europe and Western European liberal values. The wide-ranging dangers coming from Russian expansionism were summarized, and this is, from my perspective, interesting, under the term Russian pansexualism. In the late of the 19th century, Panslavism, especially Russian Panslavism as a term, was an ongoing theme in Europe's political debates. This is confirmed also by Palatsky. In his proclamation on the First Slavic Congress, he stated, and I quote, that the enemies of our nations have been successful in scaring Europe with the specter of political panslavism that allegedly threatens to destroy all the world of <coughs> freedom, education, and humanity. Probably those most preoccupied with Russian panslavism in 19th century Europe in the first half of the 19th century were German nationalists. From their point of view, Russian panslavism represented the main danger to German unification and to German territorial expansion towards East Central and Southeast Europe. We would also say panslavism or Russian panslavism was a threat for pan-Germanism as, as a concept. Consequently, the threat that panslavism posed to German national interests and security was one of the main subjects discussed at the German National Assembly met in St. Paul Church, especially after the Habsburg Slavs had convened their Slavic Congress in Prague and had categorically rejected their incorporation into a greater German empire. Some of the German delegates made the case for a preventive war against Panslavism and before Panslavism became too powerful to be stopped. For instance, Johann Eismann was of the view of the opinion that if a war between the Germans and the Slavs would break out, then better earlier than later, since the power of, of Panslavism was not yet fully developed. The Germans were with their anti-Panslavism anti not alone in Europe. In the long 19th century, also Italian nationalists <coughs> were highly preoccupied by the so-called Pan-Slavic threat. But unlike the Germans, they identified Pan-Slavism less with Russia and more with the South Slavs. Nevertheless, they used the, the same term. The Italian anti-Slavism and anti-Panslavism had developed out of the competition with Croatians and Slovenes for Trieste and the surrounding area known as the Julian or Julian March. Strong advocates of Italian irredentism as Carlo Campi, Carlo De Francesco and Bernardo Benucci, Benucci considered the Istrian Peninsula as, and I quote, as a pure Italian land and accused the South Slavs of having found it in the most latent and insidious way a pan-Slavic organization with the aim of Slavicizing 
and respectively the Italianizing the Northern Adriatic. The Italian fears regarding Julian March increased even more after the Serbian territorial expansion during the Balkan Wars, 1912-1913, since an enlarged Serbia could take a leading role, at least this was the considerations of Italian origin, a leading role in pushing forward the unity of the Slavic populations as well as Istria's inclusion into a future South Slavic state. <laughs> Finally, it was the alleged Pan-Slavic danger to Julian Marx that induced the Italians to enter World War I. These considerations are well documented in a letter of the Corriere de la Sera correspondent, Andrea Torres, to his chief editor, Luigi Albertini, from October 1914, where he pleads in favor of Italians entry into, war, into World War I in order to save the Adriatic from Slavization. And I quote, the urgent question posed today is not about the importance of Trentino, but it rather refers to the rule of the Adriatic Sea, as well as to the ethnic prevailing either of Italianità or of Slavism. We are not allowed to give up the Adriatic, neither to Austria, nor to the southern Slavto. While in German discourses, as I mentioned already before, the term Panslavism is used as a synonym for Russian expansionism, at least in the course of the 19th century, Italian nationalists meant by the same term the threat coming from the from the unity of the South Slavic populations, especially regarding Julian Marx. In the long 19th century, also the Austrians had to face a similar pan-Slavic pan problem to the one plaguing the Italians. Strongly concerned, Vienna was taking note of the developments taking place in the Adriatic provinces of the Habsburg Empire. In the same way as in the Italian case, the Austrian anxiety about Panslavism raised considerably due to the Serbian strengthening because of the Balkan Wars 1912-1913. In the Austrian archives, one can come across plenty of documents dealing with Panslavism or the Slavic threat, focusing not on Russia, but on the, and I quote, South Slavic movement aiming at the unification of all Slavs under one flag and under one denomination. This is how the police commissioner of Trieste, Hofrat Manusi, described in November 1912 in his report to Vienna the newly arisen problem in his area of control. After having, having explicitly called the attention to the danger posed by Greater Serbia, he concluded his report as follows, and I quote again. There is reason to fear that Panslavism will in the near future become even more attractive to the South Slavs living at the borders of the monarchy. Besides Germans, Italians, and Austrians, and with Austrians, I mean the representatives of the Habsburg monarchy, 
also the Tangerians saw themselves being consistently counted by a pan-Slavic specter. Hungarian spheres regarding pan-Slavism referred primarily to the possibility of Czechs and Slovaks establishing a Czechoslovakian Union, either as the third equal member of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy or even as an independent state. Especially in the beginnings of the 20th century, the state authorities of the Kingdom of Hungary registered in the region of so-called Upper Hungary an increasing activity of pan slavic <coughs> orientation, as they call it, exercised by the Slovaks. In their reports to Budapest, they were classifying this activity of pan-Slavic orientation as highly dangerous and were asking for tougher measures against pan-Slavic agitators. Lastly, the impact of perceived pan-Slavic threats in long 19th century was also significant in Southeast Europe. Especially, the Greeks and Romanian national communities attached great importance to it. It was above all the outbreak of the Crimean War in 1853 <coughs> that triggered in the recently established kingdom of Greece a debate among the public about Russia's role in the Balkans. So we can see again much vision uh, in direct connection to Russian expansionism. While the Russophile camp cherished the hope that with the help of the Tsar, Greece borders could be extended to the northeast and a new Greek dominated Byzantine Empire could be re established, the pro Western fraction in Greece, faction in Greece, so Russian interference in the Balkan as a pan-Slavic threat against the aspired Hellenic supremacy in the region. So actually against pan-Hellenism that was before mentioned by Professor Zesny. From representatives of this faction, opinions such as the following about pan-Slavism could be read in the Greek press, and I quote, as long as we have to watch Russia preparing to devour the Byzantine Empire at the first opportunity, as long as those of us who still think rationally see clearly that Pan-Slavism is the permanent enemy of Hellenism, it remains our political conviction that we must cultivate our friendship with England. Greek hostility to that what was at least assumed to be Russian directed Panslavism increased enormously in the coming years and decades in the wake of the Greek Bulgarian conflict over the division of the Central Balkan region of Macedonia. Shortly after the end of the Balkan Wars, the head of the Austrian diplomatic mission in Athens, Prince Emil Fürstenberger, reported to Vienna that the Greeks had repeatedly claimed to him, and I quote, to be predestined to become the most important and staunch ally of Austria in the struggle against Slavic danger and Pan-Slavism. At the same time, immediately after the Balkan Wars, 1912-1913, also the Romanians envisaged the establishment of an anti-Pan-Slavic coalition. They proposed the founding, and I quote, of a Balkan confederation consisting of the recently founded Albania, Romania, and Greece in order 
to paralyze the forces of pan-Slavism in Southeast Europe. So the argument of the Romanian council general in Athens, Philodor. In the 1940s, the pan-Slavic team experienced a twofold revival. On the one hand, the idea of Slavic uni unity and brotherhood was propagated within the communist bloc against the idea, against the background of the struggle against Nazi Germany. On the other hand, and this is the interesting aspect from my perspective, the demonization of communist pan-Slavism and Slavo-communism developed into one of the main ideological components of Nazism, fascism, and other right-wing regimes. In this way, the new communist threat was integrated into a long-standing tradition of anti-Slavic sentiments. For instance, in the border zone between Italy, Slovenia, and Croatia, known as the Julian March that I already mentioned, the fascists Mussolini, as well as the Germans allies, German allies, resorted to an anti-Slavic rhetoric against Tito partisans by introducing the neologism Slavo-communism. By, do, by doing so, the propagandists in the service of the Repubblica Sociale Italiana invented a new boogeyman, combining the old Italian anti-Slavism from the 19th century with the new fascist anti-communism and anti-Bolshevism of the 20th century. Due to Yugoslav's Balkan policy aiming at a greater South Slav Federation, the revival of anti pan Slavic themes and rhetoric in the 1940s experienced also, was experienced also in Greece. After Greece's, Greece's liberation from German occupation, the three year civil war which began between the communists and the monarchies came. The anti-communists saw themselves as nationalists or as national minded because they was fighting a noble struggle to save Hellenism from Slavization. According to the nationalist view, the struggle against Slavo-communism, in Greek it was Slavo-communism, so they took it from the Italian, was not only about preserving the democratic system, but above all about the survival of the nations against the attack of 200 million Slavs who, under the leadership of the Soviet Union and Pan-Slavism, were united in their ambition for access to the Mediterranean. And I close with one example, so I need only one minute. Finally, in the German case, there seems also to exist a direct connection between the traditional anti-Slavism and anti-Pan-Slavism of the long 19th century and the one of the Nazi Germany in the 1940s. Out of the pan-Slavic Russian movement of the 19th century emerged the new anti-Bolshevist enemy concept shaped by the following three distinguished features. Anti-communism, anti-Semitism, and also, once again, anti-Slavism. So let me give you an example of how this looked <coughs> like by quoting a daily command of General Oberst Erich Köpner, in which he explained to his soldiers the importance of the German Barbarossa campaign against Russia as follows. And with this, I will close. 
The war against Russia is an important part of the survival struggle that the German nation has been fighting ever since. Actually, actually it is the old German fight, fight against Slavdom. It's a fight to defend European culture against the threat of Asian Moscovite flooding, and it is finally the defense the fight against Jewish Bolshevism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will have the opportunity to discuss your paper after the second one. Then the next speaker is Jan Melbart from the Philosophy of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Jan Melbart focuses in this research on modern Czech and Slovak intellectual and cultural history. His latest book, the most involved intellectual history of Czechoslovak Marxism, after the uh, Stalinist era, the co-author of this book is City. The ultimate row over there is the Uchitka from the same institute. And the topic of the paper today is Congress of the Slavs as country revolution with Fragenzeichen. How's Fragenzeichen? Question. Marxist historiography means journalism of Marx and Engels. Thank you, Professor. I switch immediately into English and will start uh, with my presentation in English. Well, the attitudes of Karl Marx and especially of Frederick Engels, who dealt with Slavic nations and Slavism within this autorial duo towards the revolution of 1848 and the role of Czechs and Slavs is pretty, are pretty well known. Engels and Marx initially viewed the Prague revolt against Vienna with sympathy. However, after the pacification of the radical democratic current and the participation of Czech liberals in the Austrian government, they placed Czech and Czechs among the counter-revolutionary nations, enabling the restoration of the old order and allowing the penetration of Russian absolutism into Europe. On the last day of 1848, Karl Marx wrote in the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, quote, in Wallachia, the Russians and their instrument, the Turks, have begun to oppress the Romanians. In Vienna, the Croats, Pandors, Bohemians, surgeons, and similar hollowness have strangled Germanic freedom. And at this moment, the Tsar is omnipresent in Europe. Engels then went even farther, and in February 1848, wrote, wrote the Bohemians, among whom the Count de Moravia and Slovaks have never had a history of their own, of their own. And that it is absurd, according to Engels, when this historically non-existent nation claims independence. According to Engels, the unhistoricism of Czechs could have been forgiven if they had sided with the revolution and tried to enter history. But 1848 proved the opposite. The Austrian Slavs, that means the Czechs, and southern Slavs are thus spoken of as die-hard supporters of the counter-revolution who, within the framework of pan-Slavism, put the nation above the revolution, and who were driven by Germans into the arms of absolutist Russia. The then developing pan-Slavism, together with the attempts to establish it as, as, uh, at the Slavic Congress in Prague, which Engels compared to the similarly romanticizing and delirious tone of the German Hartburg festivities of 1870, was also assessed under this angle. Tass was born in the stadiums of a few Slavic dilettantes of historical science, his radical anti-historical movement, Translavs, which intended nothing less than to sub subjugate the civilized West in the barbaric East city to the village, commerce, industry, intelligence, to the primitive agriculture of the Slavic Serbs. Pan-Slavism 
according to <laughs> according to Engels, consciously or unconsciously, serves absolutist Russia and even its revolutionary current, Mikhail Bukhanin, and let us add also friction Sabina, prefer the nation, that means the pan-Slavic entity, to the revolution, and will have to be swept away in the decisive struggle by the progressive historical forces standing on the side of the revolution. What we clearly see here in this mode of writing of Marx and Engels in 1848 and in the following year is the conflict of the class and therefore revolutionary point of view with the national perspective. Questions regarding the primacy of universal, that means class or particle of national emancipation accompanied the socialist movement from its very beginning, as we have seen, and did not vanish even after the Bolshevik Revolution in, 18, in 1970. And forgive me this propagandist picture that I found on YouTube. I found it very telling and I wanted you to wake up a little bit. For example, in the era prior to World War I, we find conceptions of the nationality question based in the cultural autonomy of a multinational space, Austro-Marxism, or based on territorially demarcated national demands. That was the Bolshevik conception. After 1970s, disputes once again cropped up within the Bolshevik movement between supporters of the right of nations to self-determination that was represented by Lenin and Stalin, and advocates of a strictly internationalist approach. For example, Georgi Piatakov or Nikolai Bukharin. The Marxist-Leninist theory of so-called nationality question developed by Lenin between 1920 and 1916 and Stalin from 1913 depended on a territorial conception. This approach was a result of two main motivations. Firstly, the problem of delivering revolutionary messages to individual nations in a language they understood, nationalism, and considered their own. And secondly, the desire to beacon age-old national disputes that inhibited consistent engagement in the class conflict through the support of national claims. In this regard, Czech political scientist Pavel Barsha points out that in practice, National, nationalism was to be overcome by its very negation, that means by its very realization. It was for this very reason that Lenin formulated his famous motto, the right for, to self-determination up to and including the right to secede, which take out Bolshevik politics based on the idea that no union of nations can stand on inequality and involuntariness. In <coughs> the original fragmentation of particular national interest was to be overcome by their realization within the larger framework of the universalistic socialist project, a state of workers and peasants. Similarly, in 1913, Joseph Stalin emphasized the importance of the nationality question on the one hand and the international development of the workers' movement on the other. The post-revolutionary Soviet states tried to oblige existing national demands and support supported the development of non-Russian national identities in place where modern nations had not yet been formed, as was the case in South Caucasian region. A significant shift, well known one, took place during the Stalinist Revolution in the 1930s when class conflict was declared resolved through the implementation of socialism in one country, Soviet Russia, and when the conception of the, national, of the nation clearly turned to primordial. In a way, this shift culminated in 1949 with Stalin's famous essay on linguistics, in which he removed language from the realm of superstructure and ascribed to it an essential nature link to the national party. Although the nation was now in the Stalinist discourse seen as the primary topic, I state that the category of class did not vanish from the Stalinist vocal, vocabulary at the end. This concept, based first on the realization of national demands and later on a new pan-Slavist variant with the Soviet, within the Soviet Union, or, Mesa, or more precisely with Moscow as the pinnacle of historical progress and revolution 
was in direct contradiction to the original writings of the classics, especially of Marx and Engels, for whom the nation never represented the concept world of analysis, and who openly declared their sometimes even radical anti -science. It thus posed more than one difficulty for Marxist Leninist historiography of newly established state socialist regimes within East Central Europe, People's Democratic Czechoslovakia included. Nevertheless, the turning point may not have been so much the establishment of the state socialist regimes themselves, but the change in the tactics of the Comintern from the radical class perspective of the late 1920s and early 30s to the tactics of a popular front, of a popular front within the aim of defending nation state against the danger of fascism. Therefore, I refer to this period of a popular front as late Stalinism which is kind of a term of uh, my work in progress on, on Stalinism. It is evident that the Stalinist discourse of the 1920s and, uh, and, uh, and early 1930s is, is a different to the Stalinist discourse of late 30s. A good example of this trend was the communist intellectual and politician Jan Schwermann who in 1926 finished a text and published it, uh, which was called The Czech Question in the Revolution of 1848. In this text, Schwerma consistently adheres to the position of Marx and Engels. He develops the reason for the way in which the German bourgeoisie drove the Czech bourgeoisie to the side of the counter-revolution, counter but he does not justify the Czech law in any way and evaluates it as completely reactionary. Similarly, he evaluates Panslavism as an objective reactionary current that, instead of a concrete analysis of Marx style, aimed at utopian goals. For him, the Slavonic Congress was only a step toward destruction for, or destruction for the revolutionary movement. The practical consequence of Panslavism was the bayoneting of Slavic soldiers who suppressed the Italian, Hungarian, and finally the Viennese revolutions. In the name of the gracious potentate who promised the Czech bourgeoisie concessions corresponding to its class interests and its covertly fear of the revolution, right Schwerma in 1926 entirely in the style of Engels. In his subsequent text, entitled Marx and the Czech Question, Schwerma further defended Marx and Engels' critical assessment of the role of the Czechs and Slavs, and even reproached Marx for overestimating the revolutionary character of the Czech revolt at certain point. This is Schwerma. Similarly, as Slovak historian and my dear friend Adam Budek Noted, Ladislav Novomesky's essay from 1933 entitled Marx and the Slovak Nation adopts all the condemning thesis about the Slavic nation, which is a pretty similar view of uh, two Schwermans. And see the causes in the action of the bourgeoisie. Hudek concludes in the case of Novomesky that according to Novomesky, the Slovaks has committed an unforgivable crime against the revolution in the name of achieving their short-sighted national goals. This is Novomesky himself. The only means of atoning for these sins, according to Novomesky, was a new revolution of proletarians and peasants. This inclination towards the position of Marx and Engels started to change slightly in the late 1930s, along with the tactics of the Comintern and the new state-building role of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. Kurt Konrad's 
mid-1938 series, built on the previous Marxist analysis of 1848. But the dual nature and the dual role of the Czechs is emphasized much more here. A treacherous and reactionary bourgeoisie on the one side versus progressive people determined to fight on the other. The very same prism will be used to evaluate 1938 and the Munich Agreement in the communist rhetoric. In the post-war historiography, 1848 is interpreted as a link in the chain of our great national tradition which corresponded to the late Stalinist political claim to stabilize the formed state units in the spirit of socialism. In line with this, uh, in line with the doye of Czech national Stalinism, the historical progressive line, which we could observe in debates on Czech history long before the advent of Marxism, is combined here with a historical progressivism in which the position of the right side of history is determined by a combination of national and social considerations. According to Arnold Klima, 1848 was a struggle for national freedom, but at the same time it was a struggle of the exploited classes. The late Stalinist trope of a fusion of the class and national points of view is thus embraced. Klima here contrasts the petty bourgeoisie, especially the progressive intelligentsia, the so-called revolutionary intelligentsia, with conservative bourgeoisie. The revolutionary democrats, led by Fritsch and Sabina, the workers and peasants who are on the side of revolution, and the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie defending our national interests, which, however, are pursued in such a way that they eventually lead not only to the betrayal of the revolution, but of the nation itself. That, that is the uh, theme. This thesis implied Neerdi's and, or more precisely to say, Lenin's conception of two national cultures. The culture on the side of the people and, and revolution on the one hand, and the culture of reaction on the other. At the turn of 1940s and 1950s, this concept was developed in uh, relation to 1848, especially by Czech philosopher Karel Kossi who, in his 1953 study, provided perhaps the most elaborate combination of class and national perspectives inherent in late Stalinism. In his essay entitled The Place and Significance of Radical Democrats in the History of Progressive Czech Politics and Ideology, Kosi writes about two tendencies of the national liberation struggle that were already emerging before 1848 and which subsequently were <coughs> filed and clashed. Conservative and democratic, liberal, conservative and democratic, liberal bourgeoisie, austro slavist associated with the Habsburg monarchy, and the other, revolutionary democratic, associated with national and social liberation. The left wing of the bourgeois democratic movement, states Kossi, was most closely associated with the people most faithfully reflected their revolutionary sentiments, most resolutely fought against the romance of feudalism and most sharply criticized <coughs> the bourgeoisie. However, in Kosik's writings, there was also present a direct link to the Russian context of the revolutionary democrats of the 19th century, which was updated to Kosik's own post-war present, as he stated at the very end of his essay. For this, ardent love of the people, of their own nation and revolutionary Russia, for sympathy with the workers and socialism, the radical democrats of 1848 uh, uh, remain close to our time. Thus what we see here is not only a uh, formulation, uh, a, a combination of national and, and, and class perspective, but also their very actualization <coughs> within the discourse uh, of, of late Stalin. It is obvious that the analysis of the years of 1848 and 1849 in the late, uh, in, in, in late Stalinist Czech historiography, unlike the Stalinism of the 1920s and early 
thirteens are not directly related to the original texts of Marx and Engels. The change in the politics of the Communist Party is from beginning, uh, from being the destroyers of the state to the becoming <coughs> the stabilizing and protecting element in the second half of the 1930s, culminated after the World War II. It led to a fusion of national and class perspective. As in other cases, however, the road to this fusion was not paved by Marx and Engels, but in this case by Lenin and Stalin, who, like many others in East Central Europe, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, elaborated the theory of so-called national question. The fusion we saw in the Marxist Leninist historiography of, of early 1950s based on a combination of class and national perspective, was then gradually overcome by emerging reform communist historiography in late 1950s and during the 1960s. It is interesting to observe, as the research of Adam Budek on the Slovak and of Vítězslav Sommer on the Czech example shows, how under the critique of so-called dogmatic Marxism, class aspects were gradually displaced in favor of, of the emphasis on the autochthonic national historical development. After all, the reform communist historiography in Czech lands in the 1960s legitimized the re-establishment of the Czechoslovak path to socialism. And in Slovakia, the state legal demands on the, of the Slovak party. A large number of intellectuals abandoned in the 1960s the class perspective in favor of the national perspective. A trajectory that would also be reflected in a slightly altered mode in the historiography produced by former reform communists in the 1990s. A good example of this trend is Karol Kosik himself, who at the end of the 1950s finished his monograph, a pretty well known one, entitled Czech Radical Democracy, in which the inevitable progressive line of Czech history was replaced by the context of European revolutions and revolutionaries, and in which the year 1848 is not only seen as an important point in this uh, progressive historical development line, but as a concrete historical inter interrelated whole, as a concrete reality. As he would put it, in nevertheless, in 1968, Kosi is one of the advocates and public intellectuals that rehabilitates the Czechoslovak path to socialism, and the one who, for whom the nation is the only collective entity worth to be considered. However, this shift from Stalinism to post-Stalinism would be a start of a different story and of a different presentation. In any case, it is more than evident that the, that issues related to national emancipation were permanently present in various Marxist discourses over time, and that they underwent multiple changes. Marx and Engels' writings on 1848, respectively, as well as other peripetia and interpretation of these writings and historical moments of the revolution of 1848, are good examples of the multifaceted nature of Marxism and Marxism-Leninism in the region. Thank you very much for us. So thank you very much, and we have literally several minutes for asking questions and giving comments. It's too much already. So one, two, three, four, and close it. Well, I think we heard two excellent reports, but. Uh, um, I would like to point out that uh, uh, the basic problem for the Marxist Leninists and everything else was that uh, uh, was Gramsci applied to Italy, namely that uh, despite, of course, various revolts and even short-term revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe following 1918 and so forth, there was no Gleichschaltung uh, in Eastern and Central Europe until the communists took power following the Soviet uh, army's occupation of, of, of this area. So in effect, it was la rivoluzione mancata, as, as you know, Gramsci would say. And therefore, they, they had to, in effect, juggle, juggle I should say, the, um, 
the various pronouncements by Marx and Engels, and later on by Lenin, by Stalin. And uh, uh, it always reminds me of Stalin being a good seminarian. If, if you want any justification, you can find it in the Bible, as you can find it in the Talmud as well, and so forth. And so therefore, uh, it seems to me that the, the basic problem was that until the communists took over uh, in, in 1944 to 48, Czechoslovakia was the last one yeah, to fall to the communist rule in 48 and so forth. Uh, they had to deal with it with the lack of a real social revolution, as opposed to a temporary political revolution that, for instance, took place, you know, in the Spartacist revolt or in, in the Munich uh, uprising or even Bela Kuhn and so forth. And and this comes down uh, to the fact that in Europe of the 19th and 20th century. Prior to 1989, I don't want to go into 1989, there were only two real uh, revolutions. And this was the <coughs> French Revolution of 1789 to, uh, to 17, <coughs> everyone ended 1794, and of course the, the Russian, the Bolshevik, 1917 uh, to 1921, or, or however you want to end it. And the rest of it, of course, had to be somehow uh, railroaded into this straitjacket of history. And this is where I think all of the problems came, that you had to somehow <coughs> put the nations and the peoples in one camp or the other. Whereas it, you know, it makes very little sense when you look at some of these things. I'd, I'd like to know how the other people react to this, but it seems to me that this is a real problem. We will collect. Yeah, yeah, sure. The second one was... <coughs> Uh, yeah, a question to Mr. Skorbos, a really interesting topic. Uh, I would like really to read a book which compares the anti Slavism in Italy, Greece, Romania, and Germany. If you can write something about that, it, it would be uh, great. Uh, my question is uh, uh, how popular were the, uh, these anti pan Slavic? ideas among the Greek uh, political <coughs> allies at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, and what uh, sources uh, are there? Is, is, are there linked with, uh, with the conflict over Macedonia, with mostly Bulgaria, and there's, of course, uh, other conflicts between these two nations? We have uh, Exarchate versus Patriarchate, we have uh, 1906 uh, anti Greek uh, movement in, in Bulgaria. Uh, uh, are there links like the anti, um, anti Bulgarian moods with anti Pan Slavic, so anti Russian moods? Uh, so that's my question. Professor, again, please. I have uh, two questions for both parties. I am not so familiar with Greek history, I know something, but as far as I know, if I understood you properly, is that the uh, idea of Slavo communism was used mainly during the Civil War in Greece, right? In the northern parts, and also it was connected with Bulgarian occupation of uh, Macedonia and Thrakia between 1941-1944, because I've never even one organization which started anti-Slavic uh, uprising. Is it so? Or, uh, uh, or no? yes. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I would like to add something. I think very important for the change uh, in the attitude toward uh, Marx and Engels on, on uh, Czechs and Slovaks in 1848 was the book of uh, Russian, or rather Soviet, Soviet Russian historian Ivan Ugalsov, who wrote a book in Russian. And surprisingly, I think it was published in 1954, or shortly after Stalin's death. Uh, with sympathy to uh, Czech movement and even to the Slovak movement. Then it was translated to Czech, and uh, I found even you know reports that uh, he had several lectures here on, on, on this topic, which gave you know as a Czech and mainly as a Slovak historians courage, right? To say, and that's also why, uh, especially in the 60s in Slovakia, uh, simply this. Uh, Slovak revolution, Slovak uprising, 1848-1849, and uh, struggle against Hungarian revolution was rehabilitated in uh, public discussion with Hungarian uh, Marxist historians, especially between Daniel Rabat, who was 
by the way, the only Slovak historian, <coughs> or Marxist historian who was tolerated, we still could teach and wrote the marvelous 12 or 13 volumes on the revolution of 1848, with Erzsébet Andic, uh, Stalinist, Hungarian, uh, Marxist uh, historian. And we can say that in uh, public debate, uh, the Slovak and also Czech historians won. Because even in a period after the Soviet occupation, in neo Stalinist period, there was no way back. The text holds. Also. The last question. Uh, maybe, maybe the real problem of uh, Marxism as such might be, uh, might be very prominently, uh, very prominently said by uh, Hannah Arendt as uh, she described Marxism in, uh, uh, in her famous totalitarian volume as a pre-totalitarian concept, which might be seen in the development uh, of uh, Marxism uh, toward, let's say, national democratization uh, <coughs> strands, as you described that. And, uh, Maybe it could be illustrated uh, on the personality of Karakosi. Uh, uh, this uh, final concept might be called some, uh, something like a national communism or na national Marxism. And uh, uh, if we follow Kar uh, Karakosi's uh, attitudes after the revolution of 1989, uh, which uh, is what is really prevalent there, is the stubborn lamenting over the re reintroduction of capitalism, as, it, as, it, as he put it. Just uh, his stance maybe didn't change much. Two minutes for answers. Thank you, thank you for the question and the, the comments. Uh, very shortly, so in the Greek case, we could uh, differentiate between three phase of anti-panslavism, okay? The first phase is in the, uh, uh, in, the second, the, in the mid of the 19th century, and there is the question who will dominate the Southeast European territories being at this moment uh, under Ottoman rule, okay? So the question is who will uh, be the one uh, <coughs> re-establishing re the Byzantine Empire, the Greeks or the Russians. So this is the, the first. Huh? Uh, during it was the, after the uh, Crimean War? Yes, in, 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 in this oh. time, in this time. Then, uh, in, in Sorry, it was actually earlier, but the Megali in yes, yes, 1844. Yes. Yes, but the Crimean War yeah. is decisive because it is where the Russians are more or less going again to war with the Ottoman Empire and they are claiming that the reasons are to protect the Slavs on the Balkans. And the Greeks say, just a moment, we are the protectors of the South Slavs because we belong to the same church, patriarchist, what you mentioned before. So the second phase <coughs> is exactly the one where uh, the, you have the Bulgarian national movement in Macedonia mainly and where Greeks and Bulgarians start to compete for this territory. So around, uh, from the, especially from the foundation of the Exarchate, so of the Bulgarian service. Yeah. So at this moment, anti paslavism is mainly combined and associated to Bulgarians, but always claiming from the Greeks, behind the Bulgarians are the Russians, okay? And then you have the civil war, so the, the third phase, where of course you have, uh, you have, as you mentioned before, already an occupation of the northern part of Greek Macedonia, Greek territories of Macedonia by the Bulgarians. So, so in, in the Greek perspective, especially for, for, for the monarchists and the right-wing Greeks, you have once again the efforts of the Slavs and of Panslavism to take something that belongs to the Greeks. And then of course in the civil war, you have the combination that uh, for the communists in Greece, also the Macedonian minority is fighting, so the Slavic Macedonian minority. So uh, in, in this dimension you have against pan, again pan-Slavism, but less the Bulgarian component and more the Yugoslav Macedonian one. 
So, and this is so that they face out faces, I would say, where you have engaged a big regarding parts like this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this remark. I'm not in conflict with that. Uh, it, all the Czech, partially also Slovak communities that took over this very, with this very reality that they haven't achieved the socialist revolution uh, uh, so far. For Czechs, for Czech communists, well, the national question was kind of resolved by the establishing of, by the establishing of Czechoslovakia in 1989. For for Slovaks, it was uh, uh, it was different, but it was always there, and in their writings, you can clearly see that there is almost no programmatic writings of how how the future should be. It's always it always or most likely refers to these this Soviet reality, right, which is being used, and this happens also the questions of the theory. But yeah. We are just at the beginning of the research of, of Czechoslovak Stalinism, which we, uh, which we want to analyze from the 20s till the 1950s, and, and I suppose the <coughs> continuum of, of the Stalin discourse. Well, Tim uh, uh thank you for the remark as well. I mean, Adam Budek uh, elaborated this pretty, uh, pretty nicely uh, uh, on, 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 on the Slovak example and, and, and the role, and described nicely the role we also played there. Uh, I think Adam even stated that uh, Udalsov was less orthodox uh, than the Slovak Stalinists and, and nicely yeah. showed the, the impact he, uh, he uh, imagined for Slovak and emerging uh, Slovak reform communist historiography. And uh, thank also for the remark on Karol Kosik. It's not only, uh, he's not only reluctant about the restoration of capitalism, but he is he can clearly see the continuity uh, with his late 1960s because he's also reluctant, because who is the agent of the restoration of capitalism? These are the journals. So he he continuously moves like within this like uh, old Czech-German debate and, and, and within this circle of, of like uh, of, uh, of debate on, on, on Czech, Czech faith, so, so to say, it would be my, my point. Oh, thank you very again.